I come before you in such interesting times. I would have said dangerous times, but I don't want to sound negative. And I am before you now on a very important day when one of the most powerful nations in the world through an unenlightened leader has withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. And so that's a challenge before us today and that is not a part of my speech. I just could not help saying it. And we are lucky and fortunate that we have leaders in our midst, cabinet members who are enlightened because they had helped me and they had also given materials, encouragement, and wisdom in the cabinet meetings to support President Duterte's ratification of the Paris Agreement. And I would like to acknowledge the support, encouragement, and wisdom of Secretary Ernesto Peña, Peña without whose support for the Paris Agreement, uh, it would not have come to the Senate, perhaps. So thank you. He is one of the economic managers who staunchly supported the Paris Agreement, and the President, of course, listened. Thank you, Secretary Perenia. Of course, one of my other favorite cabinet members is also present here. I called him earlier just to pound on him the importance of security arrangements, especially during these trying times. A uh, very amiable, hardworking cabinet member, Secretary Art Togade. I didn't realize I would see him when I called him two hours ago to beef up security in all our uh, airports and seaports, but that's another matter altogether. Another cabinet member I work with directly and have been working with for the past 20 years because we share similar advocacies on improving the social fabric of society. And we say improving the social fabric of society, that would mean genuine and authentic land reform, not just by giving land to the landless, but giving them the important capital assistance and agriculture help and technology and financial assistance to the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable populations who are our farmers and our fisher folks. I've been working with him for more than 20 years, Kappa Eng Secretary Mariano. And of course, because I am basically a communicator and a leader must be able to know the policies and to be able to communicate it, whether to fora like this of enlightened individuals and institutions or even to those who may not know it but have to understand it to be able to inspire them and to urge them into concrete action. And that is the most important job. And that is headed, of course, by a friend of mine of course, much younger, but one of my um, leaders, political leaders, who helped me in past campaigns, who's now heading the communications team of the president, Secretary Martin Andanar. <laughs> and having studied national security, I realized that a nation would not be meeting its ambition. It was said earlier that any ambition is just a goal, a dream, an imagination if there is no roadmap. And that roadmap would only happen if there is security. And the issue of national security does not cover the national security that we all know, military and police. It, of course, includes the religious dimension. It includes the political dimension. It includes a socioeconomic dimension and environmental dimension is national security. And who knows that best? than a national security advisor, Esperon, sir. As you see, my background is so varied from a master's degree in national security to chairing your finance committee. That's why all the cabinet members are always smiling at me because I chair the finance committee. I wonder after January 30 of 2019 if Secretary Togade will still always smile at me. And so I, uh, I'm grateful that I am here with you today and I'm able to talk about a subject matter so close to my heart, which is culture and heritage. Maiba naman tayo. I'll just take this away. Uh, I would have wanted to talk about climate and the importance that the Philippines plays in the global arena, 
perhaps I could talk about that briefly before I talk about my speech on, on, on culture, but maybe not, because I might say something that would be undiplomatic to the country that withdrew from the Paris Agreement. Anyway, I tweeted it already. And so we have Bill Luz with the private sector here. Uh, UP President Pasquale, I'm happy to note that as I stand here today, the former president of UB, UP, and when we, we talked about climate change perhaps more than five years ago, he knows that I've been advocating that for several years, if not decades, and he came up with a very comprehensive proposal for my alma mater, the University of the Philippines, to host the perhaps the only resilience institute, which will now become a reality, and that is because of the first comprehensive proposal of UP President Pascual, UP President Danny Concepcion, and his team met with me today uh, without UP President who was abroad, I think, or out of town, but your vision, ambition, natin, ng isang resilience institute sa ating Universidad ng Pilipinas ay makakamit na po with the initial funding of 20 baht in 2018 and the 94 million funding of this year and by 2018, uh, more projects with the hundreds of millions of budget will be granted to the University of the Philippines Resilience Institute. So congratulations, UP President Pascual. I saw earlier my two, uh, two of the, again, a favorites in the uh, in Philippine government, Anna and Jeremy. I saw you earlier, where are you? Uh, Dr. Uh, Anna Labrador is a curator of the National Museum. She has made all my vision and dreams for the National Museum a reality and with the support, of course, of Jeremy Barnes. When I talked to them many years ago, perhaps in 2008 or 9, 10, and I said I wanted a Hibla textile gallery just like the Community Museum of Luang Prabang in Laos, uh, and they told me that textiles of the Philippines are just in archives. I said, let's do it. But mom, government is not supportive of culture. I'll support it. But we don't have the gallery. No, 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 we'll all do it. And now the National Museum has this fabulous textile gallery, has the Baybayan Gallery, has the Gamaba Gallery, has the Bangsamoro Gallery, has the Biodiversity Building, which is coming up now. And I'm proud to say that the Hibla ng the uh, Lahing Filipino Textile Gallery has been visited by no less than Queen Sophia many years ago, and she said that this is the best of the best of the best. First Lady Akie Abe said the same thing when she visited during APEC, and um, heads of state and, and other visitors have also gone there. So let me go to my speech. First, I'd like to congratulate the NEDA and the whole team of the National Economic Development Authority whom I work with every time for the longest time by three terms in the Senate. I work with NET, especially now that I chair the Finance Committee. And I am grateful that you will be giving us the policies needed and the legislation needed for us to be able to file it and enact it in support of the PDP or the Philippine Development Plan as well as the budgetary considerations for each government agency and department and bureau to be able to realize this. Kami po sa Kongreso ang maglalagay ng ngipin para sa ating ambisyon. Kung hindi ito susuportahan ng inyong finance committee ng dalawang uh, panig ng Kongreso, ay wala pong ito mga haligi. Kaya kami po ang tutulong sa inyo para po ito'y makompleto. And Secretary Pernia, you have my full support. <laughs> Malasakit is such a beautiful term. Ang ating major pillars, pagbabago, patuloy na pag-unlad, at malasakit. Malasakit is such a beautiful term. You're probably wondering when was that. That was in 2009 in Ondoy when I went to Marikina and, and tried to speak to one of the victims of Ondoy then. Why is malasakit a beautiful word? Because it means compassion, empathy, caring. But these words do not fully capture the full essence of what malasakit actually is. Actually, if each and every Filipino, if each and every one of us would just have malasakit, then half the problems of the country would go. Even just having a desk in a public school, in a depth ed building, let's not draw on it, wag kututin at wag sirain ang mga upuan. Malasakit yon ng estudyante. Malasakit ng ating mga guro. Malasakit ng lahat. Kaming mga senador, sa aming pagpatupad ng aming tungkulin, 
kailangan magmalasakit. Ang ating mga driver sa kalsada ay dapat gamitin ang talino na likas at gamitin ang kanilang kaalaman at wag magbuga ng maruming hangin sa mga hindi tamang paggawa ng kanilang sasakyan and to follow the Clean Air Act, malasakit. In everything we do, malasakit is so important. When you say malasakit, it's thinking of someone or something as if it were your own. Stewardship is attached to malasakit. Your actions are dictated not only by the mind, but also by the heart. You do things out of care and respect. Ang ating malasakit sa kapwa, ang ating malasakit sa trabaho, ang ating malasakit sa ating kalikasan. Who among you here actually implement Republic Act 9003 or the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act where you segregate waste at source, recycle, and compost? If this hall today or this building, you go to their comfort rooms, if they do not have at least two bins, then they are not implementing the law. If the NEDA does not have two bins in their public toilets, then you're not implementing the law. If we are not segregating garbage at source, recycling and composting in my alma mater, UP, and that's what I told Maharlag Mai today, then you're not implementing my 2001 law. Then perhaps I will cut your budget. My point is, that's part of malasakit. Knowing our laws, implementing them to the letter. And you ask me, why? Do you do it? Yes. Go to my office. Go to my home in my little farm. I'm so strict. I joked Secretary Esperon earlier, when you enter my office, it's martial law. Everybody follows my environmental laws. I'm very strict, and my staff know that. They're deadly scared to violate my laws. As one of the pillars of PDP 2017 to 2022, Malasakit is about enhancing the social fabric by first ensuring people-centered, clean, and efficient governance. Second, pursuing swift and fair administration of justice. And third, promoting Philippine culture and values. I think that I'm assigned to talk about the third. I wish I could talk about the others, but um, that's for another session altogether. I'm supposed to talk about Philippine culture and values. It is quite clear and understandable why the first two points are important in the country's economic blueprint. But perhaps you ask, why culture and values? And I'm glad that Aneda had put that. Our culture and our values define our being Filipino. Whether you are Maranao or Tagalog, whether you're Ilocano or Kapampangan or Chabacano. We can never work together wholeheartedly towards the inclusive growth and development of our nation if we do not have our pride of place and our national pride as a people. Our culture is our identity. And part of that identity is a complex and heterogeneous mix of cultures. We have more than 100 ethno-linguistic groups that should not divide us. It should actually enhance our culture and our spirit. Our different ethno-linguistic groups, each with a distinct tradition, dance, art, music, folklore, beliefs, value systems. Just recently, we launched the Cordillera project with the state universities and colleges where I asked them to research on their indigenous practices on agriculture and environment and put the research papers together in a Cordillera book. Do I have a copy? Just maybe get in the car, copy so that I can show them. And I'm doing it with all state universities and colleges. I'm doing it with UP Visayas as well so that the Panay uh, culture can also be enshrined in a book. And just today, based on the Resilience Institute of uh, Dr. Pascual, UP and its 20 campuses within the system will embrace this and have the documentation of indigenous knowledge and practices in agriculture and environment to help other SUCs as well. So we are doing this to ensure inclusivity as a nation that is a rich and diverse culture. It's a difficult challenge, but it is not impossible. Diversity should not be used as an instrument to divide. In fact, it is our diversity 
Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, 80 provinces and regions, and different languages being spoken. Mind you, languages, not dialects. Iba pa yung ating dialects. But all of this should actually be the tools to unite us as a people. Because diversity breeds richness in our culture and heritage. Diversity brings everyone together for as long as there is understanding and respect. For as long as no one thinks that he or she is superior or more deserving than the rest. For as long as we have malasakit. The PDP aims to increase a level of cultural awareness. To inculcate values for the common good. To cultivate creativity and to strengthen culture sensitive governance and development. Their current programs and efforts aim towards these targets. What we need to do is to actually strengthen these efforts and to institutionalize these programs as part of the overall strategy for development. According to the UNESCO, there are two approaches to preserving cultural heritage. The first approach is to record the intangible form, which we're actually doing along with the National Commission on Culture and Arts, whom I worked together. I wish that Chair Rio Almario was here because from the time of Chair Jun De Leon and now Rio, both national, well, Rio's a national artist and the father of Chair Jun was a national artist, they understand the importance of documentation and to document and putting it into archives. Apart from documenting intangible heritage, the other is preserving it through the living form to ensure that it will be passed on to the next generation as well as practiced in everyday life. So whether it is our tangible or intangible heritage, whether it is a song, a ritual, whether it's a practice or whether it's a carving or a woven textile, all of these, whether tangible or intangible, must be documented and must be preserved. Whether it's the hudhud of the Ifugao or the lakub of the people of Lanao del Sur in uh, Marantao municipality, or it is a chant of Ayakan, all of these must be preserved and documented as well. The UNESCO considers cultural mapping as a vital tool and technique in providing society an overall framework in the preservation of its tangible and intangible cultural assets. What do you mean by cultural mapping? Perhaps many of you understand what it is. Why is it so important? Because if we don't know what belongs to us, if we don't know what heritage bridges are there, if the DPWH would just trample upon these Spanish colonial type bridges, if old homes are just bulldozed away to widen streets, if trees are just uprooted because we're widening roads, then there's conflict there and tensions will arise. That's why even the importance of cultural mapping is actually contributory towards the security of our nation. How can we protect something we don't know exists? Just an aside, the former mayor of Giwan in Eastern Samar, forget her name, uh, according to Professor Eric Sarudo of UST, nung nangyari ang Yolanda, one of the first things she got was the byproduct of the cultural mapping of the town, which Eric Sarudo did for them. Kinap Inakap niya, kinupkup niya, at yun ang tinago niya. Naguho na ang kanyang bahay, tinago niya yun. Yun ang byproduct nung kanilang cultural mapping. That was so important to her as a mayor. I think if a DILG is here, it's important. The 1,634, tama ba, LGUs, should have cultural mapping. Because they will never realize the importance of what they have unless they know it. I think I'll put it in the... 2018 GAA, unless it's already present in the 2017 General Appropriations Act. The fundamental goal of cultural mapping is to educate and to help the nation visualize its rich heritage while allowing the reflection of what it stands to lose as a result of its collective apathy. Another one, apart from cultural mapping, is our SLTs, the Schools of Living Tradition. This was established many years ago, and w way back in 98 from my first term, I've been supporting the SLTs, not just of weavers, but different SLTs from all over the country. And I'm so inspired when I go to the DTI, SITEM, uh, Manila Fame uh, events uh, twice a year, every April and October, 
and many other regional SITEM events, and people come to me of micro-enterprises and IPs, and they say, Mom, beneficiary po kami ng either roving academy ng DTI or ng shared services facilities or the grants, micro-grants being given by NCCA in SLTs or schools of living tradition. Because these are schools of living tradition of both our tangible and intangible heritage, which must be preserved, which the NCCA is not just documenting, but actually giving away cotton threads, hand looms, and other materials, technical assistance needed for them to continue what they are doing. So apart from that, legislation is needed. So we create the Institute of Living Tradition so that these SLTs will be part of a permanent institute for ILT. So this was established in response to the approach of preservation of the arts through living form with the aim of transmitting indigenous skills and techniques to the young. To further strengthen heritage conservation in the country, we've proposed amendments to the National Cultural Heritage Law. The measure would mandate local government units to conduct a cultural heritage mapping of all areas for both tangible and intangible heritage and natural and built heritage. Concerned agencies, if their government, led by the NCCA, shall integrate and mainstream Philippine arts and culture, including SLTs in the basic tertiary and tech voc educational system. When Senator Joel Villanueva was still TESDA, we already had the MOA with him, including the NCCA, for TESDA training to include the SLTs in that region. And for the K-12 to to include the teaching of SLTs and the use of mother tongue in the K-12. to I've also proposed the creation of a Department of Culture that will ensure the preservation, enrichment, and dynamic evolution of a Filipino national culture that is rooted in unity amidst our diversity. I understand this is also in one of the priorities of the president. Recently, the Senate has also approved on third reading, waiting for the lower house to do their job, to pass the expanded National Integrated Protected Area System, or the e -NIPAS, because in 1992, the NIPAS was enacted into law long before I became senator, declaring 240 protected areas in our country, and 113 have been declared by presidential proclamation, but only 13 of this have been enacted into law. Congress is too slow. So what I did was to file a bill to include all the 113, and it's been passed by the Senate now. I'm not saying the lower house is low, okay? So don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is that we're waiting for their quick action to be able to enact this into law. So several other bills have been in Congress, and even as we await the approval of these measures, we have ongoing efforts to promote Philippine culture and values. As chair of your committee on finance, we not only ensured a higher budget for cultural initiative, but also included special provisions that would help agencies of government integrate cultural promotion and heritage preservation in implementing programs. If you look at the national budget of 2016 and 2017, they include special provisions, the DILG in particular, to ensure the establishment of a council whose purpose is the promotion of culture and the arts in all provinces, cities, and municipalities, pursuant to the local government code. Because way back when the local government code was enacted into law, there was already the establishment mandated of a council, a cultural council. And now the NCCA to coordinate with LGUs to undertake cultural mapping of tangible and intangible heritage, which shall form part of the national registry to be maintained by the NCCA. The present day's GAA also contains a special provision that protects built heritage or cultural properties and cultural landscapes from alteration, renovation, or demolition by requiring prior approval by government cultural agencies. We're very strict on this because we receive many feedback on the ground from heritage societies, local heritage societies, complaining about government action or inaction. We have many other programs by the NCCA, the National Museum, the Department of Trade and Industry, the Department of Science and Technology, the Technical Education, or the TESDA, and even our state universities and colleges aimed at promoting Philippine culture. I'm optimistic 
that we are treading the right path towards inclusive growth with enhancing the social fabric as one of the pillars of development. We have one of the youngest population demographics in the world with a median age of 23 years. This is a resource, unequaled in importance, but they need to be nurtured in ways that they become instruments of constructive change, a change that will bring us all together. Cultural considerations cannot anymore remain on the sidelines. We can't say it's cultural issue, so it's a soft issue. No, I take exception to that. These need to be integrated in education, in economic planning, in urban and rural development, in technological innovations. Filipinos, without a collective appreciation of our culture, would have no shared understanding of our past, would continue to be divided in the present, and will not have a shared vision for the future. A person without a keen sense of culture simply will not care. Culture gives us a sense of belonging and is a source of knowledge and pride and creates our shared identity. It is therefore essential to nation building. So let us all build together as one nation and let that knowledge be our dayao, our knowledge, our pride. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you, Senator Lagarda.